Hi, Andrew Ambrosius, and welcome back to The Art of Business English. Now, today I've got an interesting interview. I've just returned from three weeks in Australia. And while I was there, I decided to hunt down some of my friends who could share with us their experiences with business and living abroad. And today we have Janice Mason, who'll be sharing her experience from living in five different countries and what you should consider when you're trying to find your place in a new society. From a very young age, she was traveling abroad and living in many English-speaking countries. And originally from England, uh, Janice has now retired in Western Australia. However, today, she will give us some insight into what it is like to be a young mother of three, living in countries where you don't have a visa to work, and some of the ways you can reinvent yourself in order to adapt and thrive in a new home. If you've ever wanted to pack your bags and move to a new place with no plan, job or direction, then this episode will be very interesting for you. So let's welcome Janice Mason. Hello, Andrew Ambrosi is here again and welcome back to the Art of Business English. Today we're out in Australia and I'm here with a good friend of mine, Janice Mason, who's going to be sharing a little bit of her experiences uh, with her life uh, working and traveling abroad. So, hello, Janice. How are you? I'm very well, Andrew. Thanks for joining us. It's a Thank pleasure you. having you. Thank you. Yes. Now, um, as I said, we're out in Australia, so I'm I'm here on a bit of a trip, and I thought I would uh, interview some of my friends and colleagues just to give people um, an opportunity to get a bit of a different perspective on the world. Um, so, Janice, let's start with a little bit about who you are and and how you've come to where you are. Okay, who am I? <laughs> I am um, a retired community worker and I've been retired for a few years. So I've lived in Australia for about 30 years. Um, but I was originally, well, I was not, I was born in England and lived the first 20 odd years of my life in England. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you've done a lot of traveling since then, haven't you? I have indeed. Lived and went abroad. I have indeed. Okay, so. Uh, England. Where are you from in England? Near Liverpool. Near Liverpool. Northwest. So do you think you've lost your Liverpool accent? I didn't really have a strong Liverpool accent. Okay. okay. Um, I've got a more generic English accent. Yeah, like I me. haven't lost that, I don't think. Yeah, I think I've got a generic Australian accent. That's what happens when you live in different countries. That's right. So, uh, yeah, and that's what I wanted to really go over today. I just wanted to um, get some insight and maybe some insight for our listeners into your experience moving around and living in different and working in different countries uh, throughout your working life. So where did it all start? Okay. It, uh, probably the first time I left England was as a... 13, 14 year old when I went to live in France for a while mm -hmm. with a friend of the family. That was and common at the time? No, not common. Mm. Back in those days, so we're talking about the 50s, people hadn't weren't travelling around the world. Yeah. To go somewhere by plane was quite a big deal. Yeah. Um, so you didn't know many people who'd been somewhere else. Mm -hmm. The knowledge of the world was much less it was more, yeah. probably in some ways more exciting there was more to discover yeah there were more differences mm -hmm. in countries than there are now so you you learned french so obviously. i had i lived with a french woman and mm -hmm. i had to speak french all the time okay and was very, it a challenge very challenging <laughs> very difficult and the rule yeah. she had was if i didn't know the french word for the thing yeah i had to describe it in french oh even more Until difficult. we got there. Mm -hmm. But I learned French in a very natural way and a very, when I look back, it was probably the very best way to learn. But so, at the time, it didn't. Yeah, at the time, it was torture. To a teenager, it was torture. But it was like a full immersion. Full immersion. Yeah, and full that's great immersion. if you can do that. I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in that. Yes. I mean, we can't all spend six months or a year immersed in a language no. because most people... No have a life and live somewhere. But it's very important if you can learn a bit of a language before you go. I mean, that was my case as well. Yes. I tried to learn some Spanish before I moved yes. to Spain. Yes. But you really do learn the real 
language when you're there. That's right. Yeah. And I had learned, in my case, going to France, I'd learned French at school. Mm. So I knew some of the formal French teaching, which was the way languages were taught then. Mm -hmm. But my mother was bilingual. Mm -hmm. So I had also learned French at home because mm -hmm. one day a week we had to speak French in my family. So your mother was French? She wasn't, but she was bilingual. She okay. was English, but yeah. she spoke French fluently. Okay, excellent. So, and she felt that was really important mm -hmm. that we learned another language. Yeah. And it didn't really matter what the other language was. Okay. And I've later discovered that that's absolutely true. It doesn't matter what other language you know, any subsequent language is much easier. Okay, excellent. Because excellent. of already coming out of your own native. Okay. And language. was it difficult for you to speak uh, French once a week with your mother? No. Okay, I don't remember that being difficult, okay, but it probably wasn't as strict mm. as when I lived there and I had to. Yeah, because yeah. some, some colleagues and friends say, oh, it's very difficult to speak um, English with my kids once a week, even though they speak English quite well. They think that the kids say, no, Dad, no, Mum, I'm not speaking English with you. It's embarrassing. Well, mm. we had to. Yeah. And... and I guess, and cousins of mine have told me since, oh, we were, we were always terrified it was your French-speaking day when we came to visit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they, they were nervous because they didn't have the French knowledge that I had, and I'm yeah. not saying that I'm good at French, I'm not, I've forgotten it, but I have a really good feel still about how French people operate. Okay. Which is different from the language. It's another thing that you... So this cultural... Another thing. element you need to learn is that cultural... Yeah, okay. Yes. So you're, you're, you had a good experience in France then? Yes. Oh, okay. yes. Okay. Yes. Good. And how did that help you, do you think? Um, it, well, the one way it didn't help me was in schoolgirl French because the language that people speak in their homes, on the street, in their daily lives... Mm is not the same French that you learn in the structured in school. school yeah. And it would be the same in any language. Mm -hmm. there's, yeah. there's, there's slang or there's common usage. Of, yeah, fixed expressions. Yes, yeah. that you don't learn those in a formal sense. Yeah. So, and I don't remember the French words now, but I remember that in school, yeah. French for bread was le pain. Yeah. I never ever used le pain as bread. It was always a baguette or yeah, something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was more specific. More yeah. specific. Yeah. And then, therefore, I struggled in French at school because I knew, in one way, better than <laughs> yeah. they did. Yeah. 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 But, um, but it certainly helped hugely with English, my knowledge of English grammar. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. I, you I learn learnt, your own language yeah, better. I learned a lot of English the grammar. Structure. Yeah. And when I came later on to learn other languages, it was much easier okay. to pick up a second or third language. Excellent. Okay. So from your young days in France, mm. how did you where did you move on to next? Oh, I, I was still living in England. I was mm -hmm. just going over there for big chunks of the year while I was in school. Okay, yeah. And then when I left school, in school I learned French and Latin. Mm -hmm. And then when I left school, I decided I would like to learn Spanish. Oh, so yeah. I went off to a, an evening college and did Spanish there. And that was immersion. He didn't speak English at all, the teacher. Mm -hmm. He just spoke Spanish to us and gradually we learned bits do you think, words, but do you think it's better to have a bilingual teacher or or full? Because it's very difficult to learn. Very difficult, but Spanish, French, and English have lots of similarities. So mm -hmm. I didn't, I don't remember finding it impossible. It was mm -hmm. probably difficult, but not impossible. And I enjoyed it. Challenge was that I should have practiced it, and I didn't. I didn't go to Spanish yeah. until much later in life. And so with any. Any new learning, especially a language, you have to practice it, otherwise you forget it. Yeah. You yeah, don't, it doesn't go completely away, but, and you still retain some of your learning, but your vocabulary goes. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So a little bit 
Every day is important. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so when you when you when you finished school and you became a young adult, mm -hmm. did you where did you move on to after living in England? I would had been working in England mm -hmm. um, first of all as a journalist, mm -hmm. and then I worked in a bank, mm -hmm. and um, then uh, my husband was going to go to the United States to Oregon. Yeah. to university so I went over there with him mm -hmm. and I wasn't allowed to work yeah because I didn't visa. have the right visa yeah these issues so he was a student but we had um, a, a position with a church and we were caretakers of the church so we took care of the children during services and we mm -hmm. cleaned the church and did mm -hmm. all that sort of thing yeah. and for that we they gave us a house so yeah. we didn't earn money we had a house. Yeah, and okay. So that was our payment. Okay, and how did what? How can you, how do you prepare yourself as a young adult to move from little England, old blighty, to Andrew? I have to put it in the context of this was nineteen sixty seven, so it's yeah. fifty years ago. Yeah. When I went to America, I didn't know anybody who had ever been to America. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a common thing. It was mm. quite unusual, and so all I knew. And we didn't have a lot of American television programs. Mm. News wasn't traveling the world like yeah. it does now. So the only bit of information I went with really was that Americans don't make anything. Everything's pre-packed. It's cooked. It's in already in a tin. Um, they, they don't even make custard or gravy. They yeah. buy it in a yeah. tin. So yeah. I, this was all I knew. When I got there, it was very, very different from that. And I guess the lesson there is wait and find out what it's about. Don't necessarily... Pre-judge. Pre, yeah, pre-decide almost what's going to be happening because you'll, you could very well be extremely wrong as I was. Yeah. In Oregon, people made... Lots of food was made from scratch. Most people made their own clothes. A lot of people made their own shoes. Wow. So it was way the other extreme from yeah. what I thought I was going to. Yeah. What would have been helpful for me to know ahead of time, and nowadays it's not a, not a problem because everybody knows it, with the differences in the language, for example, well, to start with, English language is spoken by Americans, but it's Americanized, so it's got some differences. So as an example, I was telling my toddler to walk on the pavement, Yeah. which in England would be where people walk, not where cars drive. Yeah. In the States, cars drive on the pavement and people walk on the sidewalk. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> I was giving her an instruction that I understood and she yeah. understood. She was born in English. She was only a toddler. Yeah. But the American people, why would she walk on the pavement? Where, where the cars are? <laughs> going, yeah. So yeah. those, just some of those little things, you had to readjust your English yeah. to, to make yourself known and for you to know what they were talking about. Okay. So yeah. even though it's the same base language, there were there were some quite significant differences in meaning. Yeah, I find that too. Some um, British friends don't know Australian vocabulary. No. Because we've taken words from Eng uh, from America. Yeah. It's quite interesting. Yes. Yes. Okay. And what? How was? What was your perspective or opinion about the states and Oregon? It was probably the best two years of my life. Oh, yeah. I absolutely loved it. Okay. The people were friendly. Um, at that time, they loved English people because there was this royal family that Americans almost worshipped. Oh, yeah. Um, it was a very easy town to live in, that one we were in. Um we didn't have very much money. We didn't have a car. We had a baby. Um, most of our friends 
there were actually Australians. Oh, Australians. <laughs> and okay. still one of my closest friends is from yeah. those days, okay. an Australian. Okay. Yeah. Why were there so many Australians there? They were there. As, my husband was there as a student and they were all there as students as Okay. Well. Yep. But we had a really good university. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I mm-hmm. loved it. Absolutely loved it. And learned about things like potluck suppers. Which I have no knowledge of. What is a potluck supper a pot for lux. my listeners who probably have no idea what a potluck supper is? Do you know what a potluck supper is? Well, Andrew I, might think know. So, I think so, but you can clarify. <laughs> a potluck supper is where a group of people decide to eat their evening meal together, usually mm-hmm. supper evening, mm-hmm. and you make no arrangements about what food is going to be there. Everybody brings a dish yeah. to eat, to yeah. share. Uh-huh. But there's no planning. Okay. You take what we call potluck. It's just An expression. whatever, yeah. Yeah. whatever you get. And one memorable evening, there was a group of students and their wives who would meet regularly for potluck supper once mm-hmm. a month and never planned. And this one night, everybody took baked beans. <sighs> everybody. Oh. Or everybody. Home baked beans. All yes. different recipes, but home baked beans. Oh, and there God. were maybe eight big bowls of baked beans. So the person who was organising the event, it was at his home, he went down to McDonald's and bought hamburgers for everybody because clearly we needed something on top of the baked beans. Mm. And at the time, McDonald's hamburgers were 13 cents, I remember. 13 cents, yeah. wow. <laughs> well, that was, I think, the first hamburger I'd ever eaten. Did you like it? McDonald's hamburger? I probably did then. I don't really remember. Yeah, okay, okay, very good. <laughs> so what um, what took you away from Oregon? I so then you loved after, it so much. we were there two years, and just one of the things that I noticed... And this is something that still is true in my experience. While I was there, the Olympic Games were on in Mexico. We did have a television with, in fact, a round screen. That's how old it was. And we were from England, so we were interested in how the English athletes were going at the Olympics. This was an American broadcast, and they were only interested in how the Americans were going in the Olympics. And I didn't understand, I I found that really hard to believe. Now in 2018, 17, nothing has changed. If you watch an international event in Australia, the cameras will only show the Australians. Yeah, that happens to me, it's terrible. And it happens in every country in the world, Mm. it wasn't just there. It happens in Spain. And that that distresses me a bit, because I think, well, this is now the world, and there's so much mixture in the world of people, how on earth... Can you not assume that your whole audience will be only from this country? So. Yeah, well, patriotism, people love. Yes, yeah, but, but I get yeah. very sad because Australia, yeah, we sad. win so many gold medals at the Olympics and Spain, unfortunately, doesn't win that many. No. So I used to love watching the Olympics and now I'm a bit, oh. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, there's not much swimming. No, but you Spain, have Nadal. Yeah, yeah, we do have tennis, Nadal. You see, He's so a champion. He yes. is absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. So, so you're guaranteed to get watched to watch his matches. I'm, oh, I'm definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Very proud of Nadal. <laughs> um, so okay. you you like tennis, don't you? I do. Yeah. I do. And while I was in America, yeah. I played tennis quite a lot. I played every week yeah. under lights um, with a professional tennis player who was Australian, who is Australian. He's still there and he's still a professional tennis player Uh um, or coach. And I trained to be a tennis coach as well because there was time for me to do that. Uh Um, And and that was was sort of a new, whole new career. I also, in those days, computers weren't around and everything was typed. And I used to type, edit and type, Students' dissertations and theses and papers. Okay, so, so that's I would how you work re- at night. Yeah. That's so how you reinvent yourself. So, what I do you? Did. What advice do you have for people who maybe go with their husbands or partners uh, and can't work? 
I mean, what advice? Have you got a lot of free time? Well, I we had a child, a, a small child, and I used to go to bed when she did around eight o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. And I'd get up around four, two, three, four in the morning, and then I would type until eight in the morning, and then she got up, and I would, and he, my husband would, you know, do the other part of it. So we we sort of had this divided day. I worked yeah. during the night, um, and. You know, I guess it was illegal because I was paid cash. These were students. Yeah. Um, It was about finding what you can do. There will be, there always is something that you can do that will give you some either financial reward or some other payment, if you like. Yeah. It's about. I think it's about being open to anything. I knew I couldn't work in a bank because I didn't have the right visa to work. Our work for the church was okay because it wasn't money being paid. Yeah, we just had free rent. Yeah. Um, so it, it's about talking and meeting people and just asking questions. I, I'm just this great believer in finding out what's going on, what, what's going on for other people, and then sort of letting it, go through your mind and think how you might be able to fit into that. Yeah, okay. Making yourself sort of available to ideas and opportunities. opportunities. Yeah. yeah, okay, excellent. I completely agree. Yeah, I completely agree. You can't <coughs> achieve much if you just stay at home, that's for no, sure. No, life doesn't come to your house. You've actually got to go and find it. Exactly. Yeah. So what happened after Oregon? You, so you had a wonderful time and then you had to we leave. We did. We did. We had to leave. And so we went up the road... Um, about an eight-hour drive, I think, to Vancouver in Canada. Oh, I lived out in Vancouver as well for I know, a year. I know. That's where I, I met my wife. When, I know, and I remember when you went to Vancouver. And my yeah. So, yes, you went up the road to Vancouver. I did. We hmm. did. Hmm. And, um, again, that was a different place. Again, they speak English. What, what pushed you up there or what, what, was, the uh, most, what was your reason? My husband that? got a scholarship up there to do a uh-huh. PhD, so we, mm-hmm. we went up there, again as students. Um, and again, I didn't. I had a visa that I couldn't earn. I couldn't yeah. get a job yeah. with the visa I had. Um, again, a country that spoke English, yeah. but Canada's bilingual, so everything, all food labels and not all street signs, but all f- labelling was in French and in English. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't ever hear any French spoken. Vancouver's on the west coast. Yeah, the BC. French is more the other yeah, British side. British Columbia. The, the other side. Um, I mean, your perspective of Vancouver? I. It wasn't at the happiest of times for me, for, for lots of reasons, mostly my own reasons, not, not Canada's fault or Vancouver's fault. But we, I had by then, a, I had three children. Um, so three children under the age of five. Ooh. Very little money, yeah. no car, very cold climate, raining or snowing or going to rain or snow all the time, it seemed. Yeah. Um, we couldn't enjoy what was there to be enjoyed. We just didn't have the resources to do that. Yeah. So it was a pretty tough time. And because it came after Oregon, which I absolutely loved, I think that was another yeah, part of shock. it. Yeah. Didn't like this because the other was better. Yeah, sort definitely. Of thing. Um, so what, so what that, do you do? What do you do? With, how do you cope with these well, challenges? Well, I think you, you rely on, on friendships. Um, because I had three small children, one of them was in... Um, a preschool, mm-hmm. so there were friendships developed around mm-hmm. the other preschool mums and dads. Where we lived, we lived in student housing, so our neighbours were all students, so there was lots of good friendships there. Mm-hmm. Um, we did go back to to Oregon. over the state, over yeah. the border quite regularly for yeah. and, and see people, because eventually we did get a car. But I didn't have a driving license. Yeah, that's another challenge. So yeah. that was, you know, another yeah. sort of challenge. Um, but it was, you know, in life, you just have to do whatever you have to do. You, mm. you just have to accept mm. what's there and, and keep on going. And yeah. we knew that we weren't staying there forever. It yeah. was only going to be a limited time. It should only be four years for this 
thesis to be done, which yeah. it was. Yeah. And then it would be, we would be going somewhere to a proper job for my husband, some income, some money, yeah. some opportunity to, you know. That's what I find it's quite interesting. Our, our parents' generation, a lot of them started with nothing. Absolutely. With nothing, yeah. yeah. It's amazing. And now our generation, we've, I mean, we've had this great recession, but, I mean, I think... I mean, I'm 39, I'm almost 40. But, I, I mean, we were lucky. We had lots of things. Mm-hmm. We had good education. And, yeah. And, you know, yeah. went to university and never, never really struggled. Yeah. I think, though, for, for, in my case, certainly, we were, if you like, poor for about six years. Probably because you but didn't a, work. But a very yeah. big difference was that we mm. knew that wasn't forever. Yeah. Yeah. We were on our way to something else. Yeah. And it's it's not just about the money. Um, it's about a, a state of mind that that has you, well, we don't have much money at the moment, so we can't spend a lot. Well, that's okay. We, we're all right with that. We live with that. We didn't. We didn't suffer or struggle. It's no, there's okay, no exactly. sadness about it. It's oh, just that good. we didn't have... We had money to... We always had food on the table. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We, you know, we didn't. We didn't miss out, but we didn't do lots of exciting things. Yeah. Because we just didn't have the extra money to do that. Yeah. We couldn't afford a car. And then when we did when we we did eventually get a, a small car and that was that sort of changed. You could then go places. Go places, yeah. yeah do so, but we were never big spenders. But nowadays many kids, I guess, get motorbikes well, when they're young or a car yeah, when they're young and off they go. With that one. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You need need a car, need a mobile phone. That's right. And it's normal, it's not it's not something that is. Oh no! Yeah, wow, no. you've got a car. No, that's right. But that, I guess that's. But I guess maybe it would have been a little bit different if you had have stayed in the UK because you could have worked as well. Yes, think, yeah. uh, yes. So visas are nice. always a challenge for the migratory people of the world. Absolutely, and yeah. I don't know the situation these not, days. No, I think they're the same. There's you still the sta- yeah. same issues around whether you're allowed to work or not. Um, as a British subject, um, we were entitled to certain things in Canada. Okay. Because Canada is yeah. part of the British Columbia. Yeah. Um, that we weren't entitled to in America. But when we were in Oregon, we were on welfare food. We had welfare. Okay. So wow. we were entitled to that. Okay. And I don't know why. It was yeah. all, nearly all the students were, the foreign students were all okay. on welfare. Yeah. So we'd have these big packages of food that we'd pick up from a warehouse. Oh, that's very interesting. Okay. Yeah, but but this is, as I say, this is a long time ago. Things mm. will have changed. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so um, after four years of toughing it out in the cold <laughs> in in Vancouver, it was cold. It mm, was cold. Definitely, I remember it being cold, but it was it was still the summers were lovely. I loved the summer. summer. Yes, yeah, summer was okay. Yeah. I enjoyed yeah. them a lot. Yeah. So what? When your husband finished his PhD, which is mm-hmm. a doctorate, what um, what did you go after that? So then he got a job in New Zealand. Oh, New Zealand, so far away, so, far away. Yeah, yeah, the other end of the world. So was that a shock? Were you excited or? Um, I was pleased to be getting to be leaving Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, and this, I I remember now. This was interesting about this idea of. I didn't know anyone who'd been to New Zealand. I of course. barely knew where it was. You know? Exactly, yeah. Um, and this would have been in 1973. Mm. Uh, we met some people who were from New Zealand. They were students. Mm. So they said, oh, we'll show you some slides, some photographs of mm-hmm. New Zealand. Yeah. So you know sort of what you're going to. Mm-hmm. And the slides they showed us were all of, basically trees <laughs> and what in Australia would be called the bush, yeah, the countryside. Yeah, the forest. The forest. Now, we did know New Zealand was made up of three islands, mm. three big, biggish islands and then lots of little tiny ones. So there was certainly coastline, lots of it. Mm-hmm. And we're much more beach people than mountain people. Mountain yeah. people. So we were a bit worried that <laughs> no pictures of the beach does that mean the beaches are awful or something yeah. so it, it was quite a shock to get there and find that the beaches are absolutely stunningly beautiful in parts of new zealand yeah 
Um, but again, that was their perspective of New Zealand. That's what they knew and loved about the country, and therefore they thought that's what we would. We know, would, yeah. But and that's what so it that offers. No, New Zealand is great for this. In, we say in Spanish, Mari Montaña, the mm. Mari Montaña, the sea and, and the sea mountain. And mountains, yeah, yeah. Um, you've got you've got the best of both worlds. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So how was it? You flew out there with so your three flew kids. To New Zealand yeah. with three children. And I remember getting off the plane in Auckland, and it would have been for me the coldest night of my life. And I remember really clearly walking down a concrete corridor, and they had all these little electric heaters on the wall mm -hmm. and every time you went past one you'd get just this tiny bit of warm air and then you'd <laughs> freeze again and then another. it was so um primitive almost okay. yeah i thought oh yeah what's this going to be like but new zealand turned out to be a really good place mm. a really good place it's very popular to now great mm. to raise children mm. very safe place at yeah. that time the, um, I think it's still very safe. Mm, yeah, so. yeah we, we were there for a, quite a few years and it was, it was great. It was okay, good. did you did you ski? Did you, I mean, how did you meet people? Didn't what? ski in New Zealand. No. Um, school, all three children, you know, went to school. So again, that's where you meet people. If mm -hmm. you've got children, yeah, exactly. they're the best introduction to other people, to yeah. local people. Yeah. Um, and the language? Did the you language, find the... again, it was English. Yeah. So there was um, an accent to yeah, learn, the New Zealand to listen to. peculiar. Um, like the Canadian and the American, mm. you know, they, they have an accent to mm. their English that's different. Mm. Uh, so you had to learn that. And in New Zealand, the, the big difference, I think, from Canada and, and, the, and Oregon was that the native New Zealanders, the Maori people, were so much more visible and much more um, in your life mm -hmm. than the Native Americans were in either Canada or America. Mm -hmm. That was they were more removed from our daily life in those two and over there in North America than but in New Zealand, many of our friends were Maori, that was just it was normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were not quite, segregated quite, in communities. No, not, no, no, yeah. no, not at all. And so why that was that? quite a difference. Um, why was that? Mm. Because I think the Maori people generally are a very friendly, they're a very warm, they're very outgoing, gregarious. Mm -hmm. People love their music, yeah. love their dance, love mm -hmm. their language. Yeah. They're big, happy people. That's yeah. how they are. Yeah. Um, yes, there would have been the bad times, you know, when the invaders first yeah, came, the Europeans first yeah. came, but their personality is very much um, Polynesian island, yeah. happy, happy people. Yeah. Okay. North American Indians are not a very different race. Yeah. They're not the happy, happy people. They're, they're darker, I think, inside. Yeah, okay. And we did get to know a few, but not very many, and I, I don't have much, um, yeah, just different, different sort of people. And I think in New Zealand, partly their personality, in New Zealand, Pākehā, the white people in New Zealand are European-based mostly, and they're, they're quite sort of um, almost shy. I, New Zealand people? I think so. Yeah, okay. Uh, they were. Not as not as friendly and outgoing as Americans mm -hmm. and Canadians in New Zealand is very similar. They're rather quieter, a bit conservative, a little yeah. more conservative. Mm. Maybe. Yeah. Um, but somehow the the Maori and the Pakeha in New Zealand have ha, have got lots and lots of intermarriage and all of mm -hmm. those sort of so they're mixed up a lot more. Yeah. Than, okay. In North America, with the with the native people. So okay, so was that again? Different. Lots of cultural. So many many European countries don't really have these no. native cultures. So that, was new, that was very new for me to say. Oh wow! Yeah, didn't, these two very different cultures living, living together. Up, yeah, living together. That's good. It's, it's the same in Australia as well with the Aboriginal people. Mm. Okay, so your experience with, in New Zealand was very positive then. 
It was. Yeah. And did you work out there? Were you able to work? I did. I worked. Um, I did a variety of things. Mm -hmm. I kept on doing the typing and editing. Mm -hmm. And I... Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that just if I can interrupt you there. Yes. And that's quite interesting now, typing and editing, because like you were... Um, that was a version of you working online, I guess. I mean, yes. you... you yes. Yes. You could have done that job anywhere you had a typewriter. Yes. Yes. And I think that's the power of the internet and technology Absolutely. nowadays. I mean, you don't need to be in one place to do no. one job. You no. can work anywhere nowadays. That's right. Especially if you've got mm, just a few ideas, a bit of creativity and, and this drive yes. to, to do it yes. and not be scared. It's a lot yeah. easier nowadays yeah. to do those things. Back then it meant the student would have handwritten something yeah and would physically bring it to my house yeah and i would type it but the skills that you were using edit it yeah but the and skills. then it would go back and it would change and i'd retype it and, uh -huh. um but only two weeks ago i did some work here yeah. in australia which was proofreading and editing and typing yeah um, an audio statement uh-huh I've never met any of the people involved. Exactly. Yeah, it was just done. Yeah. So those skills are transferable. Yes, from, absolutely. Any, any absolutely. Yeah, it's fantastic. And most people have skills that they can use in more than one place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They just and most people think. have more than one skill as well. Yeah. And I think people just need to sit down and think about it because mm. you can reinvent yourself in so absolutely. many ways. Absolutely. And like you said before, I mean, you just have to get on and do it. I yep. mean, you need to just... Uh, not be scared and not worry too much no. and just th sit down and think. I mean, many people, they when we're, when, we, when we're at school, I want to become a doctor, I want to become a nurse, or I want to become this. And I think the system sort of pushes you down this path and you think that, oh, if you only studied an engineering degree, then you can only be an engineer. Mm. And I just don't think no, that's the case not, at all. No, no, no. And, and I think you need to place a lot of value on... What the things that you can teach yourself through experience. I mean, nowadays, um, a lot of you know these famous people like Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs. I mean, most of them never finished university. No. And but then at the same time, the system says, "Oh, you need a degree." So I think you need to have this drive and be passionate about what you're doing because you can't just say, "Oh, I'm going to be like Steve Jobs and not." finish university and then do nothing <laughs> so but I, th I also think that people need to put you know faith in their own abilities and have this desire to learn and teach yourself through I, experience i think the, the absolute key is the belief that you can learn anything that's mm -hmm. that's the key to it mm -hmm. so i learned some years ago carpentry Oh, carpentry. Because yeah. I thought, wow. it can't be that difficult, can it? Sure. Yeah. It can't be that hard. Yeah. I know how to knit. I know how to sew. Yeah. I can make things yeah. from one dimension into three. So yeah. how come I... It can't be that difficult. Yeah. It's got to be doable. So yeah. I go and get lessons and learn it. And I'm not very good at it, and I'm not mm -hmm. that you know excited about doing any more. But mm -hmm. you, mo you can learn anything. Mm. Everybody can learn anything. Whether you learn it really and become really good at it is another thing, but yeah. that's okay. Yeah. But everything is learnable. And everything is doable. And these skills, they add to your skill and base. you never, yeah. ever know what mm. skill you might be called on to use yeah. in any situation. Yeah. You never know. Especially when you're travelling. Uh, I'll give you mm. an example. Yeah. Um, one of the jobs I had in New Zealand, I was teaching deaf children to mm -hmm. read and um, profoundly deaf so they have no hearing this, this one little boy in particular had no hearing at all and he depended entirely on seeing things or feeling things mm -hmm. um, and he he had to learn how to use a sign language I don't know what language is used in Spain in Australia it's called Auslan Auslan in okay. English in, in New Zealand, it was um, called signed English. That was the language they used yeah. then. I had to learn signed English, mm -hmm. which I did learn. And then I'm teaching this little boy mm. 
to read. Was it difficult to learn that? Well, I was trying to teach him colours. Mm. So I'm trying to teach him about green. Mm. And so I show him, I take him outside and I show him a leaf mm -hmm. and I say the word because he, he needs to learn to lip read mm -hmm. and I do the sign for mm -hmm. green mm -hmm. and I have it written on a piece of paper as well so he has three inputs, clues yeah, inputs, yeah. and a leaf mm -hmm. and then I get then I find um, a piece of paper that's green yeah and he gets the same three clues yeah. This child has no idea what's going on. Why would he? This makes no, no sense. sense. <laughs> and he yeah. happened to, I remember, to be wearing green trousers mm. that day at school or green shirt or something. So I touched his shirt and you know, did the same three clues. Didn't get it. Oh, and he's getting Got frustrated. Getting yeah. The next day I did it again, did the same, different things, some of the same. And he suddenly got it. Mm. His eyes lit up and he ran around the school touching everything that was green that he could find. Oh, that's amazing. And then yeah. once that little key had been turned, then I did all the other colours over the next couple of weeks uh, because it was quick then. He exactly. got, he knew he got the, purpose. the code. He yeah, knew what yeah. we were doing now. Yeah. Oh, that's hard work. But I, I, his eyes widened up and he was so excited and I cried. Yeah. Because this is an amazing little bit of, huge bit of information for this little boy who's only five. Yeah, yeah. Five-year-olds do know their colours. Yeah, of course. It's the first thing we teach them when they learn languages, yeah. exactly. So it was another language, is, is my point for this interview. It's not a spoken language. It's a visual language. It still is another language. Definitely, yeah. And it still has all its own rules, mm -hmm. grammar. Mm-hmm. All those rules are still there. And was it difficult for you to learn it? Well, like any other language, yeah. you've got to learn it, you've got to practice it. Yeah. When I came to Australia, I taught it here for a while, mm -hmm. and then Australia chose a new language to use in Australia, and I didn't really want to learn that one as well. So it's a new sign language. A new, so here they use Auslan, which is Australian Sign Language. Yeah. When I first came, they didn't have an agreed language. Okay. So okay, I, I just I, I moved on. From there. And what's interesting, I um, I have a well, I have a friend who's also deaf, and I've just met her recently through another friend. Mm -hmm. And because I'm not a native Spanish speaker, yes, it was a bit difficult for her to read my lips and ah. and understand me in the beginning, because. I'm speaking Spanish to her, but I'm not native. So that was also like, right. oh, yeah, so that's yes. another interesting another twist. Yeah. Yes, yes. So that was quite interesting yes. as well. Yeah. All right. So you had a good time in in New Zealand. And so New Zealand was yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, and you've learned a lot out there. You, you were able to work. And then, then where did you go? Then uh, we came to Australia, okay. and that was just a change of job. Um and mm, I worked. Cultural difference? I mean, was it. Oh, again, big? yes. This. this we're neighbours. New Zealand and Australia are neighbours. And all these countries I've lived in have all been English speaking. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean they're the same. Yeah. Um, there are specific language differences, like the sidewalk pavement, you know, it's quite mm. a different meaning for the two words. Mm. And Australia has its own way of speaking that's different again. Yeah, Australian English. English. Australian English. Peculiar, yeah. So there's, um, I'm just trying to come up with a word that would have different meanings and I can't think of it. Right, yeah, it's hard to think it's of hard to think on, now on the, the spot. when you're in the middle of it. But, um, yeah. Yeah, so that there are cultural differences. Mm. And I guess the, there might be a comparison with somebody from Spain, for instance, going to Mexico, where the language would be, the base language is the mm. same. They both yeah. speak Spanish, mm. but it's Mexican Spanish as opposed to... Yeah. Cause, cause no, yeah, exactly. I mean, Spanish. Latin so, America is... The Spanish for me is it's difficult is, in those terms. Is, but there are, there are lots of things in common, mm. but there are these differences. So it's There's, the same for an English-speaking country. That yeah. They are different. Even within Spain... There are differences. 
Uh, I find it difficult when I go sometimes to other parts of Spain right. to understand the Spanish because they've yes. got their own sort of twist their on their own dialect. Yeah, the own, own, yeah. Same in England. Mm. And people who've travelled to England um, and even native English, like I am, mm. I have trouble understanding people from the northeast of England. Mm. They're called Geordies. They have a very broad accent that I yeah. have trouble understanding. Yeah. I sometimes don't catch everything a Scotsman will say. Yeah, the Scots and are very the, difficult and too. the yeah. Irish and the Welsh, you yeah. know, it's all... Um, people don't understand people from Liverpool. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so it just takes time, my, yeah. my close friend here, or one of my clo- very close friends here, when she came to Liverpool, I had to repeat everything <laughs> that people said because, I don't know, I speak English, but I don't, <laughs> I don't understand, understand these people. Yeah. Now, well, they're talking Scouse, you know. Yeah. So there are the regional dialects as well. Exactly. Um, but there are the cultural differences, and they're, I guess they're things such as the time of day you might eat. Now, in Spain, it seems that you, you, know, you eat your evening meal pretty late. Yeah. Um, in England... A lot of people eat very early. I know, it's terrifying. And that then had, oh. over here and, and in Australia, most people wouldn't make a phone call after about 8 o'clock because a lot of Australians go to bed very, very early. But they get up very early. Yes. In England, you know, they're more likely to go to bed midnight, 1 in the morning and get up at 9. Exactly. It, so there's those sorts of differences. And you have to, I sort of call them the house rules almost. You, mm. you kind of have to know that. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you can really get yourself into a bit of bother. Bother, exactly. I, I find, yes, because you want to go for lunch, nothing's open. That's or, right. Or you, yes. you offend people. Yes. You, you're re, you call them at 9 o'clock at night. And, they, and they're like, what? Oh, yes, who's yes, calling? Yes, yeah. yes. Whereas in, in, in Spain, it's fine to call people That's at right, late. Yes. Um, so yeah, these things can be very, mm, they take some time to learn though. And... There's yeah. no books on me. It's just you have to go. No, you've, yeah. you've got to work it out, I think, and I think you've got to work it out quickly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, you ask yeah. constantly, yeah. how do I do this? What do I, What would you do here? What, yeah. What's the form? What's the rule? What's, yeah. the, what's the story? Exactly. I remember being in New York a couple of years back, and I, I because I had lived over there, um, I sort of knew how... It op- how Americans operate. I had the rough idea. But we were buying theatre tickets for an evening show on Broadway. In my mind, that will start probably 8 o'clock, mm-hmm. 6.30, and you eat after the show. Yeah, okay. And that was totally... Uh, luckily, we bought our tickets early enough in the day to know that. Yeah, because you, you have your dinner or your supper or whatever after the show. I didn't yeah. expect that. Yeah, yeah. So, well, go to dinner and a show. Yeah. There you go to a show and dinner. And, and that, just these uh, little, yeah, little things. things. And that happens as well, not just in social. That happens at work oh. and, and making friends. Yes. So, yes. yeah. What, so, What's appropriate and what isn't appropriate. Yeah. And you have to be open to that. You've got to accept the fact that it's different here. They do it differently. Mm. the way I do it at home. And the way I do it at home is not the only way and not the only right way. Exactly. Mm. Otherwise, you'd be getting very angry and frustrated. Yes. It's yes. very easy when you are an immigrant to complain. <laughs> That's for sure. Very easy. Mm. Like, oh, I don't. But there's nowhere's perfect as well because I've found that there's... I mean, I love Spain and many things about the lifestyle, but there's other things which I don't like at all. But in Australia, I love Australia, but there's... Some things which I can't stand. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, nowhere's perfect. It'd be nice if we could find a perfect place. It would. I don't. <laughs> it's not possible. I think you have to create that for yourself. Exactly. That's your, own, that's your job. Exactly. Is to find your own perfect place. The geographical location is secondary. Exactly. It has no, to be. Otherwise, yeah. you'd go mad. Exactly. You have to be um, happy where you are you as do. well. I mean, or if you don't like it, go somewhere else. And wherever you live is home. Mm-hmm. I think you have to um, you have to believe that. Mm. This is where I live now. Oh, from just my perspective, 
I'm English. I was born in England. I will never not be English. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I was a New Zealand citizen when I lived there. I'm an Australian citizen. Now I live here. But in the end, I'm English. Mm -hmm. And I'm not embarrassed about that or anything. That's the way it is. So mm. I don't I don't knock England. England's got things going on that I don't like or don't approve of or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it still is where I was born. It mm. is still my birth home. Mm -hmm. Australia here now is my home. This is where I live. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's another place that's... Exactly the same. Earth home. Exactly the and same. Don't, I, don't be embarrassed or ashamed or any of those things about it because there's no reason to. Exactly. And I think um, I'm, in, my, in my case, it's the same. I I say to my mum, I'm going home mm. back to Spain. Yes. So, that's what and I'm do. here in my other home. Yes. <laughs> that's that's right. I, I say, that's, I'm, right. that's my home now. Yes, I mean, you spend, yes. once you spend, I mean, like in my case, 10 years. And living in the country, and you have your family and mm. husband or wife. Mm. I mean, that is home. That's right. So you can make your home wherever, you and can. you do need to adapt. But um, it just gets easier as, as time goes by. I think the first move is yeah. the hard one. Yeah. Once you've left your home, mm. which you define however you do define it, and it might mm. be that um, in my case I spent – all my childhood from the age of about three till I was about 23 in the same house. Mm -hmm. So that that was Your pretty common in England, you know. Yeah. So my definition of home was that house, mm -hmm. really, and mm -hmm. my parents and so on. Um, when I left that house to live in London, that was the first move I made. Mm -hmm. So to actually move from London to America was no not, not a big deal. Yeah. Well, it was, but it wasn't. As the first one was the big one. That, that was mm -hmm. back then. Nowadays, people travel those distances more readily. But um, yeah, but I still think people love to travel, but they really don't have. Many people are scared to make a big break from where they live and move and live somewhere else. I mean, many people. Oh, my friends! Oh, my family! I'll miss mm -hmm. them, and I think you do miss your friends and family. But you also grow as a person. You make new friends. You do. Yeah. I, th I think you have... I've, I really believe life is all about timing. Mm. And you create your own luck with your timing as well. That's part of it. Mm. But I think you... you yeah, you sort of visiting and, and travelling to go on a holiday, mm -hmm. go on a cruise or something is, mm. is completely different from... Right, I'm taking off for six months and see where I end up. Yeah, which I have done. I've done mm -hmm. that too, yeah. um, with no intention of moving to live somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That's not. I. I don't really want to do that. I, I can't be bothered. It's too hard. Yeah, oh, it's the effort. I've got family here. I've got loads of family in England. I've got family here. All those things you're saying about friends and whatever. I think there's a point where that's okay, and then maybe there's a point where perhaps it's just not sensible, perhaps it's age, I don't know. But it doesn't stop me going around looking at things and going other places, but maybe yeah. I, I'm quite content to have my base here. Of course, now at some as point. As a base. Yeah, and at some, at some point, point you stop I right. won't be yeah. able to do that physically. Exactly. Or... Yeah. Well, at some, I mean, it's great when you're young to travel and explore the world and live in different countries. I think it's important actually mm. to do that, mm -hmm. because, especially nowadays. I think that I notice if I talk to people friends, family, whoever, who haven't, how, what I would say, been anywhere. Yeah. And I'm not talking about, you know, a week, yeah. a week's holiday in Bali or a week's holiday in Portugal or something. Yeah. Not that. Just actually haven't been and looked and yeah. absorbed something else. They're actually missing a lot of what life is about. Yeah. I think it brings about an awful lot more of the racist issues and the yeah. the judgmental the intolerance. The yeah. intolerance, all mm. of that mm. that does get diluted if you've been there and seen what it is you're talking about. Yeah, because you know, if you based on ignorance. Yeah, if you're an immigrant, you are suddenly not the native person of that country right. and then you know 
what it's like. I mean, sure. that's something I, I could, we can also touch on. I mean, you were, even though you were in Canada and America and New Zealand and Australia, essentially you're an immigrant. So how was it being an outsider? Was it? I mean, well, the... Because you're essentially an outsider. Absolutely, really. yeah. you are. I, the most graphic um, example of that, I can't really think of too many other ones. When we were in Oregon, we had um, we had a car for a short time. We didn't have it for very long. And we drove up to Canada in this car. Mm. It had US number plates on it, had mm -hmm. American number plates on mm -hmm. it. And... That time when we were living over there, the Vietnam War was on, mm. and the the people who didn't want to go, to, who'd been didn't want to get drafted, mm. were escaped, Conscript, they conscripted were to the war. Yeah. yeah, they went over the border to Canada. They sneaked over the border, so there were a lot of um, unhappy Canadians about all these Americans coming over the border. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of ill feeling between the two countries, mm. and we had plastered onto our American car, parked in the car park outside where we were living. If you love it, why did you leave it? Mm. Assuming it was owned by American people, of course. They didn't know who owned the car. We weren't American. But if you, so if, you, if you've got an American car and you love it, why did you leave? Yeah. There's this anger, a lot yeah. of it. Yeah. And I was so offended and so hurt by that. It's yeah. terrible. We're not American, and we loved living in America, and we didn't want to leave it. And you know, we've left because of career. Yeah, different. Yeah. So it's just someone making a yes, judgment. Yes, yes. Yeah. So there was a lot of, a lot of anti-American feeling in Canada, hmm. which was actually, when I look back, not so much anti-American but pro-Canadian. Yeah. Because Canada felt, as a nation, that they were. Um, sort of overwhelmed by American culture. -ism. -ism, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they set in place things like 80% of all radio content had to be Canadian. Okay. Yeah. Other like sort of. So it's like that, protectionism. So. Yeah. I mean, that's happened. There's a resurgence of that now yes. with, in Europe and in America. I yes. mean, now this yes. populism is yes. it's quite dangerous. It is dangerous. Um, it is. It's it with Brexit. Yeah. It's frightening. But other than that, I don't really recall any particular outsider feeling. And that might be partly me mm. in that I don't have. Um, I, I tend to get on pretty well with anybody and everybody, yeah. so I don't have a... Could be personality. But I think it's also... To, to some extent. I mean, it's also to do with culture as well. I mean, if your culture is more removed, I think, from the host country, then you're seen as very different. It's more different. Yeah, more I mean, different. as be, being a British, it's probably... I mean, Yeah, and some of that's visual. Mm. I don't look... English or American or Canadian, I'm mm -hmm. Australian, probably. Yeah. You buy the clothes that you buy there, you know, so you tend to look like them. Yeah. I'm not a different colour skin yeah. or anything. Yeah. I think if you're coming from, let's say, a Spanish, you're from Spain, you, mm. might, you might have the, the olive, wonderful yeah, dark olive skin, eyes, yeah. the dark yeah. hair, the olive skin. Mm. You might look a bit different. Mm. So that might... Yeah, and then there's the language that, straight away as well. And the language yeah. would be an accent that yeah. would be more obvious. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there's, again, I think you have to consider, well, in, to some extent I'm a guest in this new country. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, I'll behave as if you've invited me here and I'm at your party. And, mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, to some extent, just... Try and learn their ways, and yeah. and actually, you have to learn some of their ways. Otherwise, you won't be able to buy food in the shops because <laughs> it might have a different name. Or yeah, exactly. Okay, well, that's very good. And then, in the end, um, how is life in Australia? Happy to have settled in the <laughs> land of Australia? Well, I've been here a long time now, and yeah, so it yeah. sort of feels again same thing. It is. There are cultural differences, yeah. and I, it's boring to keep saying it. But in the end, everybody, from wherever you come, doesn't matter what country, you have far more in common with each other 
mm. than you do indifference with each other. So you find the common ground, I mm. think, and you yeah. just go go with that. And very good. Don't lose. Don't. I think it's important not to lose your own identity, though, your own self. Exactly. And countries like Australia, especially, would struggle horribly if they suddenly got rid of all of the foreign influences yeah. that were here. Italian restaurant. I mean, mm. what would happen if an Australian suddenly couldn't have a pizza <laughs> or a hamburger? Yeah. You know, they've yeah. come from other places. Yeah, yeah. Well, so it enriches a, your culture. Yeah, it enriches. So you've got, I think you've got to keep what you know and what's your background, bring it with you, be prepared to share it. But in the end, you're living in their country and you, you have to take a bit of that on board. Exactly, yourself. a bit of give and take. So give and take. integrate well and enjoy life. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. That's been a very insightful and interesting interview and I really appreciate your time and I hope to well, see you again soon. Hopefully it's been useful. Thank you very much, Janice. Thanks, Janice. Cheers. Bye. Bye.